Excellent. The first slide is up. I think I deserve a round of applause for, uh, for managing to do that. This is Intermediate Git. It's workflows for teams. Um, before I start, can I get a uh, can I get a just a survey of where we are so that I can say something that's useful to at least the majority of the people in the audience uh, about Git? Who uses Git every day in their workflow? All of you. Great. Uh, rate yourself. Uh, beginner, media, uh, intermediate, and expert. Who's a Git expert? Who's Git intermediate? Oh, the majority of people. Great. And who's a Git beginner? So fair enough. Beginner and and nice. I like the referring to Git beginner. Nice. I like the the uh, gauge that you got with the with the arm there. Um, I was talking with a uh, I was talking with a shop, someone who owns a Drupal shop in Los Angeles uh, the other day. We were having a uh, having a beer before the last LA Drupal monthly meetup. By the way, if you uh, are in the LA area and you don't come to the LA Drupal monthly meetup, uh, which has been in Playa del Rey for the last several months, most of the last year, uh, you should. It's a great community. It's just like this, but we do it every month. Uh, we get together with our friends, we really get geeky, and we talk Drupal. It's it's nice. And before the last one, I was talking with a friend of mine who was talking about interviewing a developer um, for uh, for a job, for a contract, and uh, asked him, this particular developer, what, uh, what kind of version control do you use? Do you use Git? And the guy answered, and I'm, uh, you know, names are omitted to protect the guilty. The guy answered, oh, yeah, I know about Git, but you know what? I stopped, uh, I stopped using it. I mean, it's just a pain, you know. Uh, well, what, what do you do? What do you do for version control? Well, you know, I, I, I SFTP into the server. I, I use SFTP, you know. I'm a good developer. I know about computers. I use SFTP. I go in and I just edit my files there, you know. In Transmit, if I double-click on the file, it opens up right in my code editor right there on my... Uh, and, uh, well, how do you collaborate? Well, you know, we were using email to email zips back and forth. Now we got advanced. Now we use Dropbox to send zip files back and forth among members of the team. This person didn't get hired by my friend. In fact, like, at the, just I don't use Git, the, the, like, the line went through the name on the list at that point, and, and all the questions were just my friend being a jerk to this poor developer at that, at that point. Um, I, I, I don't want that to happen to you if you are starting to use Git. I want you to get all the jobs. Uh, I want you to be everyone's favorite programmer on your team. I want you never to mess up. And when you do mess up, I want you to cover your tracks <laughs> with astonishing fluency and, uh, and precision. That is why we are talking about Git. I, uh, most of this room is kind of intermediate, so you know uh, a lot about Git. Um, the thing that's nice about it is the distributed nature of it. So when you have the airplane problem, you have a complete copy of the repository on your own, um, on your own local. And by the way, if you fetch the remotes, you have a complete copy of everyone else's repository on your own local, and you can track or just refer to. I mean, very often you can just treat origin. You never check out master. You just you know check out your feature branches on origin master. Um, the trouble with Git a lot of the times, especially as you learn more about it, is that there's more than one way to do everything. There's more than 10 ways to do everything. And that freedom can be paralyzing uh, because you don't know the way uh, to do it. I'm here to tell you today. I have the answer. No, I don't have, uh, I don't have the answer. But what I'm going to do is narrow down options to, one, uh, to ones that I found that work um, and tell you why. I think they work. And this is where kind of being a promiscuous computer developer, someone who has had sort of a lot of clients and gone into a lot of different situations and seen a lot of stuff gone, go right and see a lot of stuff go wrong, uh, could be useful to you. Um, this is me. My name is Matt. My company is called Rather Creative. I, uh, my practice tends to be at the intersection of custom Drupal development and what is getting called front-end engineering uh, these days. So um, JavaScript apps that talk to Drupal, custom front ends that are decoupled from Drupal. Uh, that's the 11 o'clock talk, but, um, but this one is, is Git. Uh, so I solve interesting problems for clients and teams using technology. If you have an interesting problem, maybe we could come talk about it. 
uh, and and I'm assuming that you are uh, an intermediate developer, let's say someone who's not just cracking open the shell for the first time, um, that you know how to make a website uh, that you wouldn't ask me the question, what's a Drupal? Um, you know, and that, uh, and that you are okay and understand the work stage commit, work stage commit, work stage commit, rinse and repeat cycle, uh, understand branching and merging, understand fast forward merging versus non fast forward merging and maybe have some idea of rebasing and why that would be a useful thing. That's the level of, that's the level of knowledge. And, uh, and that is more or less what I covered. Um, if you think you don't need Git, I can't help you as a, as a professional developer. Um, the, the thing that, that people with experience know is I, the only reliable thing in the world is my own stupidity, right? <laughs> my own ability to make mistakes my own ability to, uh, to screw up. I've been burned so many times that I know it's worth it to start protecting myself at the beginning of a project. I, I'm sh I guess I don't have to sell this room on Git, uh, but if ever you have to sell someone on using Git, tell them it is too late to ask about birth control when you're looking at this. <laughs> Look, one of those babies has a hat, has a little hat. <laughs> I actually had off the, uh, off the Flickr Creative Commons photo search. You like that one, Greg? <laughs> I, I picked this one because it has seven adorable babies plus a kitty. <laughs> um, so, okay, but this is not you, right? You are awesome. You know, you are an excellent developer. You have been, even on your own personal projects, on your own local that have one client and one developer, you have been committing reliably to the Git repository. Uh, suddenly, you are leveling up. You start working on a team and you see this. Does this look familiar to anybody? Yes, this terrible message. I was, <laughs> I was so afraid um, of this the first time I saw it. Now I love it because uh, it means I get to yell at somebody on IRC. Um, so we are, as developers, uh, impatient, disorganized, indecisive, and insecure. Um, these are not Larry Wall's for, like, uh, virtues of the pro programmer, which are uh, impatience, laziness, and hubris. Um, this is just a state of the union. So because we are impatient, we need flexibility. Because we are disorganized, we need collaboration. Because we are indecisive, we need recoverability. And because we are insecure, we need awesome sauce. Uh, we need the ability to work on more than one, in, in other words, um, we need the ability to work on more than one issue at, at the same time, uh, to stop at any point, to switch between them as needed, because we have bosses, they're idiots, and they pull us off one project and put us on another. Um, we need to be able to collaborate with teammates at any point. One of the weaknesses, I think, in the Git flow uh, model, I, I would call it, in, in its vanilla implementation, sort of insufficiently collaborative. Uh, we need to be able to rewind the repository to an arbitrary state. More than that, we need to be able to rethink the release plan at any point, right? Where features A, B, C, D, and E uh, are going to go in, but oh wait, no, feature D is not ready because the advertiser pulled out or, you know, or whatever. Now we need to, to, um, to uh, rethink the release. And we need to, tools to make sure that we know what we're doing all along. Um, so the agenda today, I'm going to bounce between theory and practice, theory, practice, theory, practice, going between um, what I think of as some recommendations and then uh, concrete implementations. I'm going to talk about Git flow, which is the one established Git workflow that everyone has heard of and knows about. Does everyone know what Git flow is? No, okay, good, I'm glad, because those 30 slides won't be wasted. I'm just kidding, it's not 30 slides. It's 50. No, that's, that's lies. Uh, talk about the weaknesses of that, and use that as a way to talk about, uh, to propose a couple different workflows that you can use based on where you are in the stage of your project, and based on uh, what you need at any given point. And then um, give some opinionated tips, and, and kind of go into opinions uh, about... Um, general Git hygiene, keeping your Git clean. Uh, what I'm trying to avoid is the one ring mentality. There's no one workflow to rule them all. 
Um, don't be dogmatic. Don't strive for theoretically uh, theoretical purity. I, I am a, a client services guy. I'm not a computer science professor. You know, I love my computer science professors. They work under a different set of constraints than I do, and I will reliably prioritize working code or a working team, well, uh, well functioning people um, doing work over theoretical purity or the sort of the correctness. Uh, of the implementation. Git is flexible. It's a tool that can accommodate a number of workflows. So um, everything I say is right. Everything I say is wrong. The point is not to tell you the one way. The point is to give you a way of thinking so that you can make decisions about your team, your project, and your workflow. So let's work, look at Git, Git flow. When people talk about Git workflow, this is the one that comes to mind. This is a 2010 blog post uh, by Vincent Driessen, um, and uh, this is the one that sort of everybody knows about, I guess. Um, it's a little abstruse just to read it on this, so I'm going to build up this. Uh, I'm going to to build up this diagram horizontally uh, with time moving to the right. Um, GitFlow involves short-term and long-standing branches. The first long-standing branch is called master in Git flow. Uh, luckily, when you run git init and create a repository in a directory, this is the, the one that you get for free. Though I eh, get for free. Though yesterday, um, I pointed out in the intro session, there's nothing special about that name, right? It's not a magic word. Uh, you can delete the master branch and call it something else, right? Um, but we get master for free, so you'll find that uh, a lot of projects use master, and a lot of projects use master as the production state of code. So git flow uh, mandates that. Every um, commit to master is a release to production. So however we get from version 0.1 to 0.2 over there, we won't have a commit object on master unless we are releasing code um, to the production server. Uh, how do we get from 0.1 to 0.2. We have a second long-standing branch called develop that um, branches off from master at the beginning of the project, at the beginning of the life of the project, uh, and represents the latest delivered changes for the next release. Okay, Master, production state of code. Master is in production. Develop is code that's ready to go to production. Yeah? and you put all the things into develop, and then when you're ready, you uh, merge into master, tag a release, and you know if you saw the talk about Jenkins before, then the magical Jenkins machine comes in and releases your, uh, releases your code to production. Um, you don't work directly on develop, you branch off into individual feature branches. So uh, we're, we're rolling three deep now. Right, we're on. Uh, we had master. Master uh, also spawned develop at the beginning of the project. We get check out a feature branch using whatever naming convention your project uses. You work on the feature branch, and when uh, your work is ready for the team, um, you merge down into you merge back down into develop. Now notice that the line in I, I took great pains in Adobe Illustrator while I was putting all of this together. Um, I, I made long lines and short lines for the win. Uh, the, the line connecting the, the commit objects in the circular commit objects, always use circular commit objects, it's very, no, that's not a thing, um, is a short line because these feature branches are disposable. They're not long standing. And by the way, you keep them on your local, uh, at least in the, the plain vanilla implementation of this. You merge back into develop, push develop up to everyone else. Um, and you, uh, so you branch off of develop in whatever state it is when you are creating your branch. Um, and you merge back into develop when your feature is a candidate for release. So you can do as many of these as you want, uh, right? Uh, uh, you, can, you can just keep working on other people on the team are merging into develop uh, in the event that you push feature branches to the server. Um, to, to collaborate, just remember that the present state in the Git flow model, the present state of feature or feature two could be broken. Uh, might not be for, uh, uh, you know, might not be production ready code, but once it's on develop, it's a candidate for release 
um, for you know integration and code review and all those sorts of things. And then when you're ready, uh, you merge into master. There you go. You tag your release. Except it's not quite so simple. The the workflow that GitFlow advocates is actually once you think develop is ready, um, you don't want to stop develop. Right? You don't want to stop people from being able to work. Uh, so there may be unfinished features that, that want to get merged into develop at those points. Those are, you know, not ready for prime time. So when you have a, a state of develop that's just as close to being ready, um, you branch off of develop into a release branch using whatever naming convention, you know, release-0.2 maybe in this case, uh, and you work directly on that release branch to clean up, to dot the T's and cross the I's, uh, and you free up develop for other work. So um, this is, think of this as a feature branch almost for the release, though, though I haven't thought through the implications of that, so don't quote me. Uh, and then when you're ready, the release branch merges into master, and you create a tag, and, and uh, you either deploy manually or your awesome automated build script deploys for you. And by the way, and this is something uh, that you always have to do in GitFlow, um, you got to merge back into develop, right? You got to do that little redundant piece of work. Otherwise, the work, the, the cleanup done in your release branch for 0.2 uh, will be missing from develop, and develop won't uh, reflect the current production state of, of code. This makes sense so far? Not if it makes sense? Great. Awesome. Okay. Oh, 0.1. We're still on 0.1. The website is broken. Everything is wrong. You have to fix it now. Uh, GitFlow provides for creating a hotfix branch. You branch directly off from master. You call your branch hotfix-whatever, um, 0.1a, you know, I don't know, or maybe you use a date-based naming convention, something like that. Uh, you do your work, you fix the problem. When you're done, back into master and back into develop. This is the thing, back into master and back into develop. Okay. Long-standing master branch, production-ready code. Develop branch, candidates for release. When we're close to release, release branch, merged up and down. If something's broken, hotfix branch, merged up and down. It's a little intense, <laughs> right? That's a little heavy. Uh, as far as a workflow is concerned, right? Like Git is Git is flexible. It's 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 sexy and fast. Why would you drive your sports car like a semi like that? And and the the kind of the focus, the uptightness in the focus on the purity of master makes me uneasy, right? Whenever you know, right? Whenever anyone is like, oh no, it must you know, it must be this. It can't be that. Um, so right, practically, how do you alter develop? If you're continuously integrating into develop, how do you alter it, right? Like, oh, we want branch, we want features A, B, and C, and E, but not feature D. We gotta eliminate feature D. That, you know, just blows up that workflow of just merging develop down into a, uh, branching into a release branch and merging it into, into master, right? I mean, have you ever had management change its mind? You know? Um, it's organized around these heavy ideas of releases, these like big like cement block dropping into the production state. Uh, so if you are striving for kind of a continuous uh, integration workflow, um, you know, it's, may, it's, it's maybe not for you. You need special scripts or software to manage all of this stuff. There's like a Git flow package for most, uh, for most kinds of environments that is a set of scripts that like, Oh, you know, create my feature branch, publish my feature branch to develop, you know, ta uh, create a release branch, do, do all this stuff. And it does all that stuff that you can't remember, like the, the two-way merges um, and, and uh, things like this. And I, I think it doesn't really facilitate collaboration because there isn't, there isn't a way necessarily to merge another person's work into yours while before it's, before it's a candidate for release. I mean, do you branch off again from develop? Uh, then you have two feature branches for one topic. Do you fast forward merge develop? Then you're, I mean, uh, you're sort of, your topology is messed up in that, in that case. So, so what I'm going to, what I'm going to suggest um, is that we can sort of use this mentality. There are a couple things that are right about this, but that we can make two, two alterations to it that will make, um, that will make it more useful to us. Uh, they're alterations that belong to different stages of the project, and they they involve um, 
messing with the assumptions, changing the kind of fundamental assumptions. One, keeping master pristine is no big deal, right? Two, don't have a long-standing dev branch because branches are cheap and easy uh, to, to create and destroy and get, and we can make them when we need them and have whatever we want in them. Um, I'm going to uh, propose to you that there are two stages to, to a project, and this is not a theory of project management or workflow. This would not get me a, like an Agile Scrum certification. I just, uh, I just want to make an observation, broadly speaking, um, that uh, things that uh, development projects fall into a, a sort of new development phase and a maintenance development phase. Let's use the metaphor of a house. Um, in the development phase, everyone needs one another's work. You can think of us all pulling together. The whole team is establishing baseline sort of foundational aspects of the, the project, and we need to integrate everyone's work into our own work all the time, right? Think about building a house. You pour the foundation and everyone needs the foundation so that they can build the foundation. You frame out the walls. Everyone needs the walls so that they can put their things in on the walls. So uh, we're all working on foundation together and we're all working on walls um, together, right? And at this stage, fundamental changes in project architecture are more likely than they are at other stages. Uh, there's less technical debt, right? So you don't have to you don't have to deal with the accumulated tonnage of uh, decisions up to a certain point in order to say move a wall, right? It may be a pain in the ass to move a wall in this at this stage of a construction project, but it's a lot easier at this stage than at this stage, right? Once you've you know. I don't know, you've run plumbing and electrical and started hanging drywall and, and other, construction, uh, other construction metaphors. And this does not make you a bad developer if you have to move a wall because very often uh, the problems with an implementation don't reveal themselves until it's built. I'll give you all a minute. You all see it? Um, Uh, right? Uh, in, in an agile, agile process, this is actually sold as an upside of the process, the ability to make, to make uh, changes like this. So, um, so in this development stage, in this early development stage, I'm going to propose to you a, uh, a fetch and re, uh, rebase workflow. Um, a lot of branching models are based on the idea of a known good point in the code. That's usually a release state. Right, and uh, everything from now on is done based on the the current production release. Um, in in the develop in the early development stage, you don't have a known good point; you have an emerging good point uh, that comes. So you want to always be on the latest good point and not working off on your feature branch, completely divorced from master. Uh, so you're going to check out a feature branch from the latest known. Work point, and this is by the way after uh, fetching and merging origin master into master. Assuming you have the latest master, right? You want to check uh, check it out and work uh, on your feature branch. Don't push it to the server yet, right? When you're done, maybe there's been some other work pushed to master, especially in a fast moving project. So what you can do is fetch and rebase your work on top of origin master so that your feature branch is always uh, branching off of the latest good state of the code before, right, right before you merge it. It's very unlikely that in the, in the you know, three seconds that this situation exists, someone else is going to push. But you know what? If, if they do, <laughs> you just rinse and repeat, right? You check out their changes, rebase on top of those, and then, uh, and then merge in. Um, and by the way, uh, at this rebase, this rebase is the point where everything will break if there's conflicts. So you fix your conflicts. You're going to have to fix the conflicts anyway if there are conflicted, uh, conflicted things that have been worked on on master while you've been working on your origin, uh, while, while you've been working on your topic branch. Um, so, uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to pay the piper eventually. Pay it now. Um, mm 
Yeah, I did this. Uh, oh, right. Uh, put your master up to the latest master, and then you get a nice no fast forward merge and push that to master. Yeah. Do you work like this? I do. Because, I mean, I've been on teams and it can get really messy mm. and conflict galore. Yeah. I mean, because everybody's pushing all the time mm. up there and it's just like one conflict after another and you need somebody to sit there and just monitor conflict and try to sort that out and be working on that versus working on Sure. In a project with with 60 developers or something like that, where you're all working on that, I mean, I would propose that that's actually, some of that is a social problem rather than being, get, rather than being strictly speaking, a technical problem. That is to say the organization of work ideally will be done in a way where there's a separation of concerns between developers. Does that make sense? That you and I are not going to be working in the same function on the same module at the same time. If that, if we are, we kind of have a planning problem more than we have a, a technological problem, right? Um, does that make sense to you? Uh, working on the front end, CSS is uh, is a case where everyone does the thing that you're saying. Everyone thinks they own all the CSS all the time, and uh, and wants to do it. So. You know, uh, having project owners, I mean, having a, a area of interest owners can be something that's, can be something that's good. But I, I found even in pretty fast moving, actually, even when I was sitting next to another guy and he was, uh, uh, I'm thinking of my friend Scott, and he and I were like trying to speed code, outdo one another, right? Like get more stuff committed on the master branch than the other guy. Um, the time between the rebase and the merge, that is to say between block three and block five, is so small that you're probably not going to have problems in that, uh, in that thing. Now, if, if my, my point is, if you have problems, if you have conflicts, you're going to have conflicts anyway at some point. Deal with them now while you're developing your feature branch. Don't wait for the integration man. Like, don't don't you know, nominate someone as the integration manager. They are responsible for all merging and for uh, the dev stage production workflow. And that person is going to try to read the developers' minds. You know what I mean? Cl uh, we all clean up our own mess, and we do it uh, at the point where we rebase or at the point where where we merge. Does that make sense? It doesn't. Uh, answer your question necessarily, but there may not be an answer to your question. Um, so when you have to go back to this branch after you've, you've done it for a little while, uh, same workflow, slight, slight difference. Grab the latest master, make sure your master is at the latest master, uh, switch to your feature branch, and fast forward your feature branch to the latest master so that once again you're on top of the, you're at the very tip of the continuous integration workflow. Um, does anyone want to fight me about no FF? Or does everyone realize the beauty and utility of no FF? Good, I'm very glad. Uh, the, um, for the benefit of the recording, I'll say it's useful to see in this graph of a log, it's useful to see at what point something left master and at what point it, uh, it went back in. I find that to be a good good thing for debugging sometimes when you're trying to figure out when a regression got introduced into code. Yeah. So therefore, you're saying uh, a fast forward you wouldn't see that. You wouldn't see that, right? A fast forward just moves the pointer, says git tell this branch to point at a different SHA one instead of the SHA one that it's pointing at. That's what a that's what a fast forward merge is essentially, and. Uh, you know, and you would have a straight line of dots rather than being able to see the um, the stuff here, some of which I've redacted, uh, in order to you know, in order to kind of know for your own peace of mind where things have gone in. Um, the one warning I I have this, I do this all the time. This is I mean, this is my preferred way, honestly. Um, one thing about this, take it away, Charlton. Charlton Heston, not Chris Charlton. Uh, thou shalt not rebase commits that thou hast pushed to a remote repository. It's over. 
it's it's done once it's in on the once it's on origin that is the permanent record of that it's not strictly speaking true but it's best to behave as though it is. So if you need someone else to look at your feature branch, you push it to origin, you no longer can rebase that thing and you're into recursive merge land. That's fine. But thou shalt not rebase commits, thou hast pushed to a remote repository. It happened to me not two months ago where a junior dev on my team rebased, pushed, uh, and I was left in this impossible uh, situation and had to uh, whip out my handy friend push-f. Um, once, uh, once you're in maintenance mode on a project, you have a house, you're doing small scale repairs or remodels, uh, the team is generally split off one person to an issue or, uh, you know, uh, a small team of people to an issues. Uh, and the issues that we're working on probably have better separation of concerns, which means they, they don't have fundamental architecture, uh, this is all probably. They don't have fundamental architecture um, implications for the architecture of the project or for one another. Then you can uh, switch into a topic branch workflow that's a little bit more like Git, Git flow. Um, so from master, right, you can check out a whole bunch of topic branches, work on them, uh, master representing the known good point, because we're now in a situation later on in a project, maybe where we have a known good point that represents maybe the production state of code. Um, if any, uh, if any of these top, and then, you know, uh, you check out these branches on top of master, you do your work, um, on them. If any of them outlast a production release, you probably have to merge the production release into your topic branch just to make sure that you're not, uh, you know, that you're not working across purposes with your own repository. Um, and then uh, when you're ready, when you're ready to stage or release, right? And I'm envisioning, I'm envisioning in this a team that has maybe different dev environments where you can build a branch on a dev environment. In order to you know, in order to test the work on topic branch three, say. But now we're ready for staging. Instead of that long-standing dev branch being a release branch, we can take the release branch right off of the the current state of master. This, by the way, solves the problem of hot fixes, right? Because now we don't have this like thing where we need to make sure the hot fix goes in. We're always just uh, checking out from the current the current production state of the code and. Did you know that a merge can have more than two commit parents? It can have arbitrarily many commit parents, right? A commit has zero or more parents. Uh, zero at the beginning of the repository or at the, if you check out a branch that's detached from any other branch. Uh, normally one parent, but in the case of a merge, uh, to, in a case of a recursive merge, two or more. So, you know, super easy. Now you have your, uh, now you have your staging branch. Put everything in. Uh, if there are conflicts, you resolve them at this point. You can deploy that to a staging server. Um, and, uh, you know, it's also possible to use like a pull request workflow or something like this into, into staging. But that's, um, you know, but that's still a lot more lightweight than, uh, than Git flow. Um, did that build out anything? No. So uh, thinking visually, whereas at the, in the early development stage, we want really one line with blips coming off of it, representing feature branches. In a situation like this, we're looking at more this kind of thing, where you have a known good state at the bottom, all the development branching off from that, and as you go, it narrowing back into a production release up at the top, right? Visually, just instinctually, that's what you have to happen. You can use both workflows together because sometimes you're in this situation where you have a house, but you're trying to add on a big thing to it. So it's possible to branch off a topic branch that is like the remodel topic branch and use the continuous integration flow in a team of half a dozen developers, say. Uh, as you go. So it's not dogmatic one or the other, but, but the point is think about the state you're in. Am I in a state where uh, a continuous integration model is, is working? Um, am I in a state where, uh, where a topic branch and then uh, kind of dev staging production workflow uh, makes more sense? 
We started a little bit late. We've got about 10 minutes left in, in the session. I, I, um, do you want to stop for questions and discussion now, or shall I just push on? I'd like to push on into some get hygiene tips and then some cover your ass tips uh, a little bit after that. Okay, don't be too, too proud to use a GUI. Uh, I don't use a GUI for a general Git workflow. I work on the command line in Git. But um, visualizing, the, uh, visualizing the topology of the repository is something that I find really useful to me. And I do that all the time. It's like next to git status, source tree is probably my second most used git command. Um, not to, you know, and you can get very into it. It lets you do a lot of stuff. You actually can do all the branching and merging. You can do uh, uh, you conflict resolution, all that kind of stuff in, in source tree. I just look at the pretty picture that's up on, up on the left. Um, and yet there is a kind of tyranny to the picture. Remember to prioritize, prioritize efficiency and a well-functioning team over a pretty, a pretty picture in, in, the, uh, in the visualizer. Um, there are also, uh, so this is source tree from Atlassian. It's free. It's probably the best free one. Um, there's also uh, ones for pay. I know on Mac there's one that's really good called Tower um, that a lot of people use and really like. Um, Commits should be small, logical units of work where all the changes in the commit... <laughs> Craig is shaking his head at me. In my humble opinion, commits should be small, logical units of work where all the changes in the commit are related to one another. Does that make sense? I mean, does the thing... Do I need to make a case for the thing that I'm saying? No, it makes sense, right? Um, even if you work on 30 files, in, in, uh, at a particular time, I would argue that it's worth the time to you know, break that out into three or four commits by adding the individual files that you want uh, into each commit so that they're related to one another, right? Like, you know, commit one, work on you know, login redirect subsystem, work two, uh, the, you know, the, I actually do it a lot with theming workflows where, where the templating will go into one commit and the SAS will go into a separate uh, into a separate commit, and then if there's behavior, the JavaScript will go into a third commit, right? That's maybe a little more fussy than you have to be, but but I'm I'm a little uh, anal like that. Um, but but don't just the, the the point of doing this. Don't just get commit A and write like work, you know, as the commit message, right? Or like if you're a fancy developer, you know, WIP, because you know it stands for work in progress, right? Like that, that doesn't help me. As, as an integration manager or as a team lead, I need to be able to cherry pick commits. I need to be able to revert individual commits. I'm glad to see heads nodding because Greg made me really insecure about this when we were fighting about it two nights ago. Um, so that your commits contain nothing extraneous. Also, by the way, make sure you're Git ignoring literally everything. Right, you're you know on Apple systems, the DS store file is the is the awful one. Um, you can uh, you know you can get ignore at various at various levels. One that I like to do is I I work in Sublime a lot, and Sublime has project files. I leave those in the repository. Uh, I don't necessarily want to put that in the global get ignore file because it's not relevant to the other devs. Uh, inside the .git directory, there's a place where you can. Uh, get ignore things locally only in your own copy of the repository that you have checked out uh, at that point. I think you can do it globally in your, uh, in your Git settings in your home directory as well. Um, if you're using package management, if you're using Composer or Bower or anything like that to manage packages, the vendor directory should be Git ignored. You don't track other people's code, right? If you're using SAS and compiling, uh, the SAS into CSS, the compiled CSS should be git ignored. You're not tracking that stuff and it's part of your build process when your server uh, spins up a production release that the, uh, that the SAS gets compiled. That's a, I mean, you know, that's a, that's a whole different thing. With 8 it's going to be a lot easier because, because of Composer. Um, mm, very, I mean, look, I'm going to say that very often I just put the Drupal web root as the root of the repository or as like one directory deep in a public folder in the repository if there's stuff like keys or whatever that need to be outside of the web root um, and track all, of, track all of Drupal core. It would be better 
probably to have a Drush make file that builds it all. But at that point, I, I don't see the benefit I at that know, point. I was just looking for a cover for the PDF. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're going to patch core. Yeah. Any reasons to write a patch against those files? Yeah. Ooh, if you write a patch against core, dump the patch out, dump the diff out into a patches directory in your thing so that when someone like me comes along uh, in the rescue project stage <laughs> and wants to know what the hell you've done, have you ever just dumped vanilla Drupal over a repository just to see what the diffs are, just to see where they've broken literally everything? Sir? Uh, I was just going to talk about the vendoring and putting those in Git. And I think, and I know you probably disagree with me, but I think for a lot of like corporate projects where you're not, it's not an open source project, you're not going to be sharing it with anyone else, it doesn't hurt to put the, the vendor directory, the NPM module directory, and even the SAS files, because especially for the SAS files, that way you don't have to install SAS mm -hmm. on your... You mean the compiled CSS? Yeah. Now, right, so, okay, there's a good point, right? Like, I don't have access to a build process that can... I don't have access to a build process that can uh, lint all the JavaScript, concatenate and minify, compile the SAS for me, right? I can't do that. I can't run node install on the dev machine, so I'm going to do this. Let me, let me, propose, uh, let me propose an alternative to you that, that I think might make us both happy. If you have a build step that you can do locally into a distribution directory, into a local distribution directory, and then you can use git subtree push, to push that up to production and deploy in, in that state. Or your integration server, right, can do it all integration and can be innocent of it. But I, I, I see, I feel you in a corporate environment. For me, um, I just, I don't want to track other people's code. You know what I mean? Like my repository has only the things that I am responsible for. At least that's a theoretical position. I, I get the corporate argument as well. I do get that sometimes a vendor director you want to make sure that they have are you pinning versions in your package JSON? Oh, files? I absolutely am. Um, and I haven't encountered this problem so much with packages and Composer, which has been pretty excellent, but NPM is down yeah. you know, fairly regularly for a, a package manager that people are supposed to rely on. Hmm. Um, and so if I vendor that, I don't have to worry that it's down. My production process doesn't, you know, my deployment process doesn't care if GitHub's down, which happens rarely, but it does happen. It right? was the other day. Right, exactly. And, so the less external dependencies I have, sure. and I get that I don't want to track other people's code in there, but I mean, you know, at, at some point, like you were saying, right, I don't necessarily care how clean my draft looks. Sure. Um, I just want to get working code that I know is working, and the last thing I want to do is track down a problem with, like, some weird dependency that was different because some idiot pushed, forced right. pushed a, a rebase. Oof. Right? Oof. Like, because that can happen. shouldn't. You're hurting me. Hurting me, bro. I feel you. Um, yeah. Uh, there's also, I mean, there's also, you could think of like a two repository model, right? Where there's a working repository uh, that is clean. Because the other thing for me is like, I guess I work on a lot of client projects rather than working in the thing. So my uh, prejudices are tilted towards that right. sort of thing. Uh, that, uh, that set of concerns, I mean. And um, I've like... I've uh, tried to clone a Git repository and had to like walk down the street to have a coffee because it took so damn long because there was so much in there and database dumps and Photoshop documents. And I know you're not talking about that. You're still talking about source code. But um, in order to keep it fast, minimizing what you have to move across the wire, at least what Git has to move across the wire is good. I mean, how it's moving across the wire anyway. But what what if, and I'm just riffing here, I, you're right. And like I said, everything I say is wrong. You know what I mean? Because the thing is making smart choices about your own individual situation. Um, what if there are two repositories, right? What if there's a development repository and then a production repository where you go in, do your build process, Commit everything in, commit the production state of code, and deploy that to the deploy that to the repo. That adds a step that you don't want necessarily. Right, and I guess if you know, like, if I care a lot about the speed at which the new developer can clone the repository, right? If that matters to me a lot, um, and, and I see that that's a problem, and yeah. that, that's an approach I might take. Otherwise, I, honestly, just adding vendor is not not the end of the world. Nope, it's not. Um, 
Hey, uh, you know what? I'm the next presenter in this room, so I can I can kind of push on. I will mention one problem that you brought up too, with something sure. like that, is that if you go down the road and you haven't touched vendor in a while, and someone does a shallow checkout, you're going to have a problem with, with the bootstrap. You need to remind them that you need to take the whole repository. Because in some of our build processes, we only do a shallow uh, uh, checkout. Sure. Shallow clump, excuse me. Right. So just something to keep in mind. You might not get that today. Right. That's a good point. Yeah, the big repo I was talking about came from Steve. Yeah. No, it didn't. It's that rescue project we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> three, three gigs of images that we've committed. <laughs> if you want to, um, interactive staging is, oh, I'm so torn. You know what? This conversation is better than the rest of my slides. Let's talk. Um, I was just going to add, like, if you're working in a Pantheon, yeah. Sorry, can you speak up? Oh, Pantheon, if you're using a hosted thing where you don't have access to command line tools, right? You gotta. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so your the workflows that you suggested today, I think uh, one thing that I didn't quite follow is uh, where and how you will involve the code review process mm -hmm. um, to them. So can you talk about that? Yeah, code review comes before the merge, right? Like if you're using a pull, I, it depends. Are you talking about like a pull request workflow or something like that, or like? The yeah, pull requests, yeah, mm -hmm. pushing feature branches into a pull request or something like that. Sure. Okay, so I would propose two things. In the new development model, um, I would say that code review is kind of an ongoing process, that you're that whoever is doing code review is always looking at the tip of master and kind of verifying it and signing off on it. Yeah. Does that I mean does that make sense? I'm I would propose Yeah, I would propose that rather than with every little tiny Branch and merge, kind of building in a building in a code review, or uh, building it in at uh, at a predefined time along, you know what I mean, every seventy two hours or something like that. We're going to do uh, we're going to review the latest state of master. Um, I would I would put code review in the step before uh, get checkout staging um, in my second workflow. Right, so when the four uh, topic branches have work on them, there are candidates for inclusion in staging. Right at that point, either via a pull request on something like GitHub, which is a really neat tool because you can comment and reference lines and stuff like that, or or else in whatever process that you have, like checking out the thing in a dev environment and looking at it, or just combing through the diffs, whatever. Um, that that's the point. That's the point at which you. That's the point at which you do that. Yeah, does that make sense? Um, if you get really anal, you can interactive stage. Your commit messages should not look like this. Right. Um, commit messages. Let me let me end on good commit messages. I had a lot of stuff. I have a, oh, thanks. I have a lot of stuff uh, about actually saving yourself. Um, if you've ever get reset hard, uh, if you've ever get reset hard head minus one, and lost your last commit, did you know you can get it back? Get ref log is a list of everything that's been on head, everything that head has pointed at on your local, uh, in your working copy, right? And so head, uh, you know, head, uh, what is it, tilde one, or, or head braces one, or something something like that. It, they're, all, they're all listed when you get ref log. Um, you can just put master back at that SHA, and you have your, you have your magical commit back. Um, commit messages should concisely describe what the commit change is. They should begin with a verb. Largely, uh, like technical issues, implement, refactor, change, debug, um, and they should include a why, uh, right? Not IE fixes. That's a terrible commit message. But add wrapper div to fix positioning in Internet Explorer 8, right? That has a verb, an object, and a why uh, in it. Um, Th there is like a soft 50 character practice uh, if you're working on the Linux kernel um, for commit messages, largely in modern tools, you don't need to do that. Uh, something about branch naming. Uh, hi guys, come on in. We got started the last session a little late, so since I'm doing both, I'm pushing uh, on a little bit. Um, and then let me just leave with the idea that the Git repository is work product. Um, <coughs> the Git repository, if you're doing client work, is something that belongs to the client. And actually, this is actually probably a difference between doing client work and, and working inside of an organization where you have continuity with the organization. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, 
it's possible to look good or bad as a developer based on the contents of your repository and even based on the, the topology of your repository. And if you've ever come in behind someone and had to clean up their mess and looked at the Git repository and seen, uh, you know, seen a spider web in the topology, um, it doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, it, you, uh, you engage the facepalm. Um, right. This only applies to the public repo. This applies to the remote. What you do in the privacy of your own local is nobody's business but your own. Right. But um, think of Git like programming. Right. The map is not the territory and the territory is not the journey. Uh, you have a process of arriving at a solution that's distinct from the solution. So however you work, um, however you work, you can adjust uh, the Git repository so that it looks like you were brilliant all along <laughs> with uh, interactive staging, with interactive rebasing, some stuff we didn't have time to talk about. Uh, anyway, um, the next session is starting in just a minute, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Thanks, guys, for having a really good conversation. <laughs>